of scripture reading before the lesson comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. play tag as a kid? I did. And I feel pretty confident that you played tag too. Do you know what the number one most important thing to do when you play tag is? You have to find base. Did you call it home? I think we called it base. But I don't think we ever called it home base. Did you? You had to find a place that as long as you touched or, or clung to that pole or a tree or a wall or sometimes a can that was laying in the middle of a field, whatever it was, you know. As long as you were there, you were safe and you couldn't become it or you couldn't get it, whatever that is. You couldn't become frozen or catch some kind of unnameable disease that was transmitted from one child's hands to it. You know what I mean. I think you played that, and I think you understand that concept. Now, consider this. In this life, temptation is everywhere. Whether it's in the privacy of your home or whether it's in the most public place that you could ever walk into, the devil is seeking to devour you. There has to be a place of safety. There has to be a place that as long as we abide... In this place, we have peace, we have safety, we have comfort, refuge. We have to have a place that's a safeguard from the devil. We're speaking about like-mindedness here off and on. We've already determined some things. We have to have the same standard. Do you want to be like-minded In religious matters, yeah. We have to have the same standard. You remember that standard is the Bible. And specifically the New Testament. We have to have the same standards. How do you live your life? Well, it needs to be in harmony with this book. How do we worship God? We have to worship God in accordance with this book. And specifically the New Testament. We have to have the same spirit. Remember those three different spirits? The Holy Spirit. That is... We have to have the same teaching, believe the same things. We have to have the same mindset, disposition, or attitude. And we're all made in God's image as human beings. Well, today, we're going to talk about like-mindedness and from the aspect of having the same safeguard. Question. What is your view of organized religion? It seems to me that, by and large today, many people are totally opposed to organized religion. And some people say that all you need is Jesus. Give me Jesus and you keep the church. You keep your organized religion. I can worship God by myself right here at home and that's all that really matters. Well, I have a question. Does the Bible teach that? Does the Bible teach that doctrine? 
does the Bible teach that organized religion matters? Because if the Bible teaches that organized religion matters, then we need to find that one organized religion that matters to God. Here's the assertion. I am asserting that the church of the New Testament is our safeguard. Now let's see if I can prove that from the scriptures. Is that okay? Three B's this morning. Number one, the safeguard is the Lord's church because the Lord's church is blood bought. Do you realize that? Let me tell you something about church. This building is not church. This building is a building. However, you are sitting among the church. Didn't you know that? The church is the people. The church means the called out. So when we say the New Testament church or the Lord's church is blood bought, that means there are blood bought people scattered all throughout here. Did you know that? Number two, the safeguard is the Lord's church because the Lord's church is the body of Christ. You'll see the bees. Blood bought, body. And then number three, the safeguard is the Lord's church because the Lord's church is the bride of Christ. Do you need a safeguard from the world? The Lord has established that safeguard, and that safeguard is the church. Church never means building. It always means people. Now, let's see what we can figure out today. Number one, the safeguard is the church, that is the Lord's church, because the Lord's church is blood-bought. Now, quickly, what is a safeguard? A safeguard is basically a place of protection. There are a lot of different things that could be said about what is or is not a safeguard, but basically a safeguard is a place of protection. Has God given us such a place where we can have protection, where we can be safe and have a level of comfort? Yes, He has, and that place is the church. Not a church, not just any church, and it's certainly not like the movies you see where somebody will run into a, a building of a place of worship and then the evil whatever can't get in there because, no, 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 no. This is a building. The people are holy because the people are blood bought. Now, I think, and I can say this as I think, everyone in this building sees the importance of Jesus of Nazareth dying upon Calvary's cross. Do you see the importance behind that? I personally have not met a person who reads this book, or for that matter, any type of religious book that I know of, who, see, who says that Jesus of Nazareth and his death upon the cross was unimportant. It, it doesn't matter. It was just some other guy who died some other way. I, now, I'm sure there are people who think that Jesus is unimportant. I just haven't met him. Maybe you know him. All of us in here, I think, believe and see the importance and the beauty behind Jesus of Nazareth dying upon Calvary's cross. But... I have met several people who have said very clearly, give me Jesus, you keep the church. Where does the Bible teach that? Where does the Bible teach that? Everyone sees how important it is and was for Jesus to die upon Calvary's cross. But did you not realize that the church is blood bought, paid for with the blood of Christ? I know people who will say it doesn't matter what church you're a member of. Even if you're a matter of any church at all. All that matters is that you're spiritual. If you're spiritual at home and you do whatever they think, I guess, is living a good life, then you're fine. Well, where does the Bible teach that? Is that our safeguard? Is to just stay at home? Hide ourselves at the house? It is not. Look at me in Ephesians 2, what we just had for our scripture reading. Friend, we need to remember why we need the blood of Christ. We need to remember why it is that the church is blood bought. Why did Jesus die? Ephesians 2 verse 1, and you hath he quickened, that is he's made you alive, who were dead. Dead or death is separation. Separated in trespasses and sins. Sin is missing the mark. 
God has set a standard, and when we miss it, high, low, left, right, any other way than hitting the target, we've missed that mark, and that mark is sin, the transgression of God's law. Now look at verse 2, wherein in time past. Paul's reminding them, don't forget where you came from. In time past you walked or lived according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation. That has nothing to do with your speech and has everything to do with your manner of life. Your manner of life in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature. Nature is a learned habit. They weren't born this way. They became this way by living in sin for so long, were by nature the children of wrath even as others. Have you forgotten what sin does? Sin separates us from God. We are no longer in a place of safety. We do not have a safeguard when we sin the first time. And we're all, principally, in principle, out on our own. All by ourselves with no hope in the world. But God has made a place where we can have a safeguard. And it is a safeguard. Look in verse 6, this same chapter. And hath raised us up together. We were down in the depths of sin. But God has raised us up together. And made us sit together. Where? In heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. Do you know what those heavenly places are here? It's the Lord's church. It's the blood-bought people. Look at me in Acts 20 and verse 28. And I'll prove this even more clear than what that is. Generally, in Acts 20 and verse 28, it is correctly used with regard to the responsibility that the eldership has to the local congregation. But there's another statement in Acts 20 and verse 28 that is definitely Worthy of note. Now go back and look at verse 17 when you get a chance and you'll see that Paul called the elders of Ephesus to him. Now he wasn't at Ephesus when that happened, but these are the Ephesian elders, the elders of the congregation in Ephesus. And he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, that is to the eldership, that means they have to live correctly. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, that's the church, they must lead correctly, over the which the Holy Ghost, that's the Holy Spirit, hath made you, now that is specifically to the eldership, hath made you overseers to feed, that is to shepherd or to pastor. Did you know I'm not a pastor? I'm not. Because I'm not a shepherd. Because I'm not a member of the eldership. I'm an evangelist, a gospel preacher. Over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. Now watch. Which he hath purchased. I would say by and large as soon as the preacher would get done. You're going to shake some hands. You're going to smile. You're going to say whatever. But you're going to go somewhere and purchase some food. Do you understand the idea behind purchase? What do you When you purchase something what do you do? You pay for it. Don't you? Swipe it on a card, write a check, something. He hath purchased, what did the Lord purchase the church with? What does the Bible say? Purchase the church with his own blood. Does organized religion matter to you? Oh, it matters to God. The precious blood of Christ was shed to buy the church. As you will pay cash for your lunch or charge it on a credit card or your check card or whatever it is. You purchase something. Do you understand the idea of purchase? We are purchased. We are members of the Lord's church. We are blood bought. We are bought at a very high price. The things that you value in this life that you paid a lot of your hard earned money for. Do you value them? Do you take care of them? 
Something surely you do. How do you think God views the church that his son, his only begotten son, paid for with his own blood? It's a heavenly place. We've got to speak the same thing about the church, brethren. Because the church, the Lord's church, is paid for. We are a blood-bought people. And we need to remember that. Don't poor mouth the Lord's church. He paid for it with his own blood. It's very precious to him. Now, when we determine what the Bible teaches on how to become a member of the New Testament church, listen to me. We can figure out how we meet the blood of Christ. Did you know that? Why? Because the church is a blood-bought place. We are blood-bought people. So when we figure out how the Lord adds us to his church, guess what we figured out? We figure out how to meet the blood of Christ. Are you familiar with Acts chapter 2? Probably to a certain extent, many in here are. In Acts 2 and verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And there's a promise given. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Skip down to verse 41. Not everybody there believed that. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Well, what were they baptized for? For the remission of sins. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Do you see that? Well, where were they added in verse 47? Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added, what does the Bible say? The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Is there anything in the universe other than the blood of Christ that can forgive sins? So when you see what how we acquire the forgiveness of sins, you see how you meet the blood of Christ. And you see when you meet the blood of Christ where God puts you. God puts you in the church. Do you know why that is? Because the church is purchased with Christ's precious blood. What does organized religion mean to you? Ah, give me Jesus. You keep the church. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible does not teach that anywhere. Number one, brethren, the safeguard is the Lord's church because the Lord's church is blood-bought. The church is our safeguard because it is where we stay in contact with the blood of Christ, 1 John 1, 7. Now, number two, the safeguard is the church, that is, the Lord's church, because the Lord's church is the body of Christ. Now, the theme of the book of Ephesians, if you had to just try and boil it down as much as you could, the theme of it is the church, and that would be the church of Christ when you begin to look at it. And the New Testament teaches that Christ is the head of the church and that the church is the body of Christ. Look at me in Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 22. This is in the middle of a long thought here. Paul <laughs> Paul could speak the longest sentences of anybody I've ever seen in my life. You remember being in elementary school when you had to start diagramming sentences? I would hate to diagram this because it starts in verse 15 and goes all the way through verse 23. I don't even know where to start. But verse 22. And hath put all things under his feet. The Father hath put all things under Jesus' feet. And gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church, and then look at verse 23, the church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. If that doesn't make sense, look at Colossians 1 and verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. I mean, that's pretty plain, <laughs> right, right? This says the church which is his body, he's the head of it, but Colossians 1 18 says it, the same thing, maybe a little clearer. Now, true or false, to a certain degree, we all love our physical bodies. True. How do I know? Well, I can look around here and tell. Everybody in here is dolled up. Looking nice. Smelling fresh. Right? We all love our physical bodies. Listen, there's nothing really wrong with that. Trust me, I'd rather you wash than not wash. 
And I know you'd feel the same way about me. You'd much rather me wash and wear clean clothes and be nasty, wouldn't you? Okay. So we all prepare our physical bodies to be seen. And there's nothing wrong with that. But did you prepare your mind this morning? Now, we prepare our bodies, don't we? We take care of our physical bodies. We get our hair done and all, put makeup on, brush your teeth, whatever. That's fine. But did you prepare your mind this morning? Well, we shouldn't. Look and be in Ephesians 5. With regard to the church as the body of Christ. The church is blood-bought, but it's also the body of Christ. Do you take care of your body? Well, obviously you do. Does Christ take care of his body? Do we have a safeguard? Oh, yeah. Very much so. Look at me in, the five, in Ephesians 5 beginning in verse 28. So all men to love their wives, how? As their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. You take care of your body, don't you? Yeah. But nourisheth and cherisheth it. Now look, even... As the Lord, the church. Do you need a safeguard this morning? Mm -hmm. Where is that safeguard? It's the church. Why? Because the church is the body of Christ. Do you take care of your body? Well, obviously you do. Does Christ take care of his body? Obviously he does. For we are members, verse 30, of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Since the church is the body of Christ, a legitimate question would be, how does Christ treat his body? He loves it. He takes care of it. He makes sure that his body is taken care of, just like you do yours. Don't you? You make sure you look good. Christ watches over and takes care of his spiritual body. His spiritual body is the church. Therefore what? The church is the church of Christ. Very plainly. The church is our safeguard because the church is the body of Christ. Do you remember a man by the name of Saul at the time? In Acts 8 and verse 3. We generally, most of us would know him as the Apostle Paul. But for a, a significant period of his life, he was known as Saul. And Saul made havoc of the church. Look at Acts 8 and 3. Saul was terrorizing the called out people. Saul was terrorizing those blood bought people who were paid for and purchased with the blood of Christ. Now, do you remember what Jesus says to this man in Acts 9 and verse 4? Saul was ter terrorizing the church. But when he sees Jesus, Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me. Now what's your view of organized religion? I can tell you what Jesus' view is of the one authorized and organized religion on the pages of the New Testament. You treat those people bad, you're treating Jesus bad. Do you want to treat Jesus badly? No. Then what? Be kind to the Lord's people. Don't belittle them. Don't talk about them because it doesn't work out too well for those who do. Now, number three. The safeguard is the Lord's church because the Lord's church is the bride of Christ. I think it should be obviously clear that the closest and most intimate relationship between human beings on this planet is that of a lawful marriage. You know what a lawful marriage is? One eligible man and one eligible woman united by God in the state we generally call the holy matrimony, and for what ought to be one lifetime. Now, there are two exceptions to that. Why do you come up with two? Death. Your spouse dies. Your lawful spouse dies. You're, you're not married. And then Matthew 19, 9, except it, that is the divorce or putting away, be for fornication. Only one living reason, and that is fornication. So marriage is a beautiful thing. Now, listen to me. It seems to me very clearly that part of the reason that we don't understand or respect organized religion is because we don't understand or respect a lawful marriage anymore. 
Did you know that the Bible compares the relationship of Christ to his church to a marriage? Now, when we don't understand marriage, when we belittle marriage, when marriage is just like a change of clothes, I'll go get me another wife like I'll change shirts. That's the wrong attitude, isn't it? And that attitude, I believe, has affected our mindset about organized religion. Listen, every organized religion isn't right, but one of them is. And that's the one we need to find. Look at me in Ephesians 5 here yet again. Look at verse 22 beginning. In Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, listen, the point is Christ and the church. The illustration is a lawful marriage. But there are some things that we could see here and apply to our lives about our marriages that would definitely help them. Ephesians 5 verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as that is in the same manner unto the Lord. What caused you female members of the church to obey the gospel? Was it because your husband was threatening you? No, you, you saw your spiritual need. And you submitted yourself to obedience to the gospel. In like manner, what does the Bible say? Wives are to submit themselves to their own husbands as that is in the same manner that they did to the Lord. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. Who said this? An inspired apostle. Even as Christ is the head of the church. And who is Christ the Savior of? The Savior, the Savior, one Savior, right? Do you see that? The Savior of the body. Is that what the Bible says? Verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ. That's the point. So here's the illustration, but it's no less binding. So let the wives be to their own husbands in how many things? Everything, but look at verse 25. Lest we be accused of favoritism. Husbands, love your wives. Now that'll hold right there, wouldn't it? Is, it? is that just as binding as what he said to the wives? Yeah. Love your wives even in the same manner as Christ. Also, love the church. And gave himself for it. New King James has all female right there. That is her. Christ leads and the church surrenders. Christ loves and the church submits. A quick illustration. Are you proud of your lawful spouse? Are you proud to be married lawfully to the person that God joined you to? I won't look at some people because I don't necessarily know if I want to know that. Do you remember the reasons why you chose each other? Oh, let me look this way. Do you remember? Oh, I'll, let me look down. <laughs> I'm taking now. Do you remember the reasons why you chose each other? Now, let me ask you plainly, members of the Lord's church, are you proud to be a member of the church of Christ? Don't be ashamed to be a member of the Lord's body. Why? Because you're also the Lord's bride. How should a husband treat his bride? Beautifully and wonderfully. Question, how does Christ treat his bride? Are you trying to find a safeguard in this life? You found it. You may not have known what you were walking into, but you've walked into it. And it's not this building. It's these people. The church. The called out ones. Christ loves you enough to die for you. Do you love him enough to daily live for him? I think we can. Christ loves his bride. He cares for and seeks what is best for. The bride of Christ is his church and the church is our safeguard because the church is the bride of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. I have espoused you to one husband. Christ has one bride. His one bride is the one church that we read about on the pages of the New Testament. Christ has one body. And his one body is the one church that we read about on the pages of the New Testament. Do you want to be like-minded, religiously speaking? Friend, then we got to speak the same thing about our safeguard. What is our safeguard? It is the church of the New Testament, the Lord's church. 
Do you know that the church, and that is the Lord's church, is the place of safety from the devil who is seeking to devour you? Turn with me to the book of John. Quickly look here with me. Book of John chapter 10. I have several friends who think they understand these verses. And their mindset is, give me Jesus, you keep the church. Well, if you don't realize the church is blood-bought, go read Acts 20, 28. If you don't realize the church is the body of Christ, look again at Ephesians 5. If you don't believe the church is the bride of Christ, read Ephesians 5 again. But look here in John 10, beginning at verse 27. My sheep, is that in red letters? I mean, Jesus said it right. My sheep, hear my voice. How do I hear the Lord's voice? He speaks through the pages of inspiration on the New Testament. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. How does Christ know you? When you do what he says. And they follow me. How do we follow Christ? By doing what the New Testament teaches. And I shall give unto them. Them who? Those who hear his voice. Those that he knows. And those that follow him. And I give unto them eternal life. And they, now watch, shall never perish. Neither shall any, do you see it italicized there? Man Man is added to help clear the meaning. Pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Why would I read that? Why would I read that? When the Lord adds you to his sheepfold and you stay where you're supposed to stay, you ain't got nothing to worry about. Let me say that one more time. When the Lord adds you where you're supposed to be to his sheepfold, which is the church, and you stay in Christ, you stay under the blood of Christ, ain't nobody coming to get you. Do you understand that? The devil is not going to come and get you and rip you out from the blood of Christ. You walk away from it. You walk away from it. Do we have a safeguard, friend? Yes. What is that safeguard? It is the blood-bought church of our Lord. It's not a building. It's a group of people. Does church matter? Yeah, absolutely. The false doctrines of man belittle the church, but the truth of the gospel is it's blood-bought. It's the body of Christ, and the church is the bride of Christ. Will you let Christ add you to his church? He's able. If you're willing to submit, what do I have to do? How do I enter into this safeguard? Hear the truth. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Believe the truth. Acts 13, 39. The law of Moses cannot release you from your sins, friend. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Repent of sins, Acts 3, 19. Read that verse. Repentance is tied to conversion. Change. To go from being dead to being made alive in Christ, spiritually speaking. Confess the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10. The confession with the mouth is made unto salvation. What is that confession? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And listen, you have to be. You must be immersed in water for the right reasons. What does the Bible say those reasons are? We already said Acts 2, 38. For the remission of sins. The only thing that can forgive your sins is the blood of Christ. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Then the Lord adds you to his church. You're in his safeguard. You stay and abide in the doctrine of Christ, and you have nothing to worry about. Brethren, we have to walk in the light. 1 John 1, 7-9. Choice is yours. Remember playing tag? The devil's trying to tag you and he's trying to get you to go to hell. Don't let him get you. Enter into the Lord's safeguard now. As together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.